Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of the UCL DeepMind lecture series. I'm Mihaela. I'm a research engineer at DeepMind and a PhD student at UCL. And together with Jeff, I'm going to talk to you today about generative adversarial networks. So let's start with an overview. Why are we interested in generative adversarial networks? Well, generative adversarial networks are a type of generative model. And generative models learn a model of the unknown underlying data distribution from a set of samples from our data set. So imagine this very simple 1D example. This is our data set. We have our points here. And we're trying to answer the question, what kind of distribution could have generated this data? And we can answer this question in two ways. Firstly, we can learn an explicit model of the data this kind of probability distribution show here. And then we can answer questions using this model. We can ask, well, how likely is it that this point comes from the original distribution? And the answer in this case, well, would be not very likely. We haven't seen any samples here, and our model thus has no mass here. But we can also then sample from this model, just like we usually sample from probability distributions, and generate new types of data. And this type of model that models the probability distribution directly is what is called an explicit model. On the other hand, we can also learn implicit models. In implicit models, we don't model the probability distribution explicitly. What we learn is a type of simulator that is able to generate new type of samples that have the same statistical properties as our original data without being able to model the distribution explicitly. So now we have some new data points shown here in blue that match the properties of the data. And importantly, we've generalized. We don't only see the points in red. Now we, we're able to generate new points, only that we want these new points to kind of capture the statistical structure of our data. And very likely you've seen generative models before, and you've probably seen explicit likelihood models. So the kind of model that has access to a probability distribution. And often these models are trained by what's called maximum likelihood. In maximum likelihood, we train a model to maximize the probability distribution of the data under our model. And such models are probabilistic PCA, factor analysis, mixture models, and so on. And you can also train neural-based models using maximum likelihood, things like pixel CNN, pixel RNN, WaveNet, autoregressive language models, and so on. But when you want to train latent variable models with maximum likelihood, things get a bit more tricky. And that's when, in practice, we often use approximate maximum likelihood. And in another lecture, Andre has talked to you about how to train variational autoencoders using approximate maximum likelihood. But today, we're going to talk about implicit models, this kind of simulator models that just generate new samples without giving us access to likelihoods. And we're going to focus on one type of implicit models, specifically generative adversarial networks. And why would we want to focus on generative adversarial networks? Well, one practical reason is that they're able to generate samples that look like this. So these are samples from Big GAN a model that Jeff is going to talk to you about later, in which the model trained on ImageNet, a data set that has a lot of variety. It has images of boats, birds, dogs, food, and so on. The model is able to learn that statistical property present in the data and generate samples that match that and samples that look very photorealistic. So these are all generated from Big N. And this is specifically remarkable if we think of how this progress has been made through the last few years. So the original GAN paper in 2014 showed that we can go from simple images of digits to images of faces, black and white, small resolution. But from there, a small revolution has started kind of going faster and faster into generating better and better images. So we go from black and white to colored images, then we go to higher and higher resolution of face pictures of faces, then we break the image net barrier in 2018. These are the first uh, models that are trained on a data set that contains such variety as we've seen in ImageNet. 
Then we start to generate faces at very, very high resolution with progressive GANs. This is starting to look quite photorealistic. Then big GAN comes along and we're generating image net samples, not only on a um, high diversity data set, but also at high resolution, very high quality. And then we move on to style GAN, which was published last year in which the author showed that you can really generate very high quality samples that look indistinguishable from photos to the human eye. So if you were to ask me whether this person here exists and this is a photo or is this a sample from a GAN, I will not be able to tell the difference. This looks incredibly, incredibly realistic. So this really inspires us to think, well, how are GANs able to learn this probability distribution so accurately that we're able to generate this high quality data? And the answer is that they learn to generate data through an implicit model, so our model doesn't have this explicit likelihoods, via a two-player game. And our players are a discriminator that learns to distinguish between real data from our data set and generated data generated by our model and a generator. And the generator learns to generate data that fools the discriminator into thinking it's real. So it has to generate really quality good quality data such that the discriminator thinks, well, this looks as good as real data. So let's look at our players in a little bit more detail. So our players are both, are both going to be modeled using deep neural networks. So our generator is going to have as input latent noise. So what do we mean by that? We need, in some sense, to model the entropy and the variety of our data distribution. And the way we do that is that we have a distribution on the input of our model. Because remember, on the output, the generator now will not have any distribution. It will just produce samples as the output. So if you've seen something like a variational autoencoder, you're used to having a distribution on the output of the model. Here, we have absolutely no distribution. So in order to model the entropy of the data, we have to have a distribution in the input. And often, this is um, multivariate Gaussian noise. And interestingly here, this noise is often much lower dimensional than the data. The data is going to be a high resolution image, while the noise is going to be something like 100 or 200 Gaussian latents. We take a sample from our latent noise distribution. We pass that through our deterministic deep neural network that transforms that distribution to generate a sample. And that sample can be images or text and so on. The discriminator, on the other hand, has a different task. The discriminator has to answer the question, given some set of samples from our data, and given some set of samples from the, our model, are these real or are these generated? So it has to answer the question of distinguishing between these two distributions, the data distribution and the model distribution. And perhaps in a less adversarial view, we can think of the discriminator as a teacher, a teacher that learns what you're doing well and what you're doing not well and tells you how to improve such that you get better at better at generating real data from the generator's perspective. And from this perspective, we can think of the discriminator as some sort of learned loss function because the discriminator guides your training, the training of our model, but it while it guides it, it also improves itself. And in the original GAN paper, this was done via a two-player game. So now we have a minimization with respect to our generator. This is our model. And a maximization problem with respect to our discriminator of the same value function. And this value function says, well, make sure that the discriminator is very good at distinguishing between real and fake data in a classification sense. So we're trying to train a discriminator as a classifier to maximize the log probability that the real data is real and to maximize the log probability that DA predicts that the generated data is generated. So D so far is a classifier. Once D is trained, so this is what the min-max game is telling us, that once the discriminator has been updated, we need to train the generator. And the goal of the generator is the opposite of the discriminator. It's a minimization problem with the same objective as the discriminator, but with a different sign. And the goal of the generator is to minimize the prediction accuracy of D. 
in order to make sure that the data that is generates, it generates is classified as real as opposed to fake. And if we think about this from an algorithmic perspective, how would we implement this? Well, we'll implement our discriminator and our generator as deep neural networks, and we will, taint, we will train them using stochastic gradient methods. So to do that, we first have to train our discriminator for a few steps in practice, this is one or two. So remember that the min-max game said, well, I have to maximize with respect to the discriminator before training our generator. That would entail doing multiple steps of optimization. But in practice, we don't really have the resources, the computational resources to do that, to update the discriminator to optimality every time we want to update the generator. So we only do a few steps of gradient descent for the discriminator. And the way we do that is, well, we sample a mini batch of data. We sample a mini batch of noise latents from our prior. We pass that through the generator. Now we also have a mini batch of samples from the generator. And we update the discriminator by stochastic gradient methods to make sure that our loss is being maximized. So we want, again, to make sure that we maximize the probability that real data is real and maximize the probability that fake data generated by the generator is classified as generated. Once we've done this small inner loop of updating the discriminator, we can move on and update the generator. And now the generator aims to make sure that the data that is now generated, so we sample a new batch of noise samples, we pass that through the generator, we have a new set of generated data, that this data is classified as real by this new improved discriminator that we keep, we've kept improving in our last stage of uh, training of the discriminator. So we have this game that we alternate between improve the discriminator at distinguishing between real and generated data, then use this new discriminator to update the generator such that the generator generates data that, discriminator, that the discriminator deems as being real. So the take home message so far is that GANs are able to generate high quality samples through this implicit generative model trained as a two player game. A discriminator that learns to distinguish between real and generated data and a generator that learns to generate data that looks so good that the discriminator cannot longer distinguish between real and generated data. And we've seen that this is done as a zero sum game. We have a minimization with respect to G maximization with respect to D of the same value function. And this has a lot of connections with game theory literature. We can think of Nash equilibria. We can think of strategies that the two players might employ. We can use things such as fictitious play to improve our game. But in practice, it's perhaps also interesting to think of GANs from the perspective of distance or divergence minimization. And that is because we often think of generative models as doing distance or divergence minimization. And very often, explicitly, our loss function is a distance or divergence. So we've already talked about maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood ma maximizes the likelihood of the data under the model, which is the same as minimizing the KL divergence between the data and the model. And why would we want to do divergence or distance minimization? Well, divergences and distances give us some really nice connections to optimality. If the distance between two distributions is zero, then we know that the two distributions are the same. So from the perspective of learning, if we've trained our model to minimize this distance and our distance is zero, we know that our model is a perfect fit of our data distribution, which gives us a very nice guarantee. And again, if we look at maximum likelihood, the objective is ma of maximum likelihood is to minimize the scale divergence, which is the expected value. So this is this integral under the data distribution of the log ratio between the data distribution and the model. And because this is something that we minimize, so we minimize with respect to the parameters of this model P of X, we want to make sure that this is as high as possible, because then this ratio is as high as possible, this uh, ratio is as low as possible because this B uh, star is fixed. This is our data distribution. So though this expectation is as low as possible. So we want to make sure that P of X is giving high likelihood to our data, which is very intuitive. We want the model that is able to explain our data. 
And yes, the KL divergence has the same property. If the KL divergence between two distributions is zero, then our model has learned our data distribution. But one question that you might have here is, well, if we are able to say this for a lot of distances and divergences, if they're zero, then our model has learned the data distribution. Why are we concerned with different divergences or distances? And the answer is that, well, in practice, our model might be misspecified and it might not be able to model the true data distribution. And this can even be the case for very deep neural network models, because it might still be that our data set, for example, ImageNet, is that complex that we're not able to model the data distribution exactly. And in that case, we might, add, we, we might, might, might want to ask, well, what kind of different trade-offs these different distributions have? So for example, here, our data is a mixture of two Gaussians, and our model is going to be a Gaussian distribution. And the Gaussian distribution cannot model our full data distribution because it's a misspecified model. And one question that we might have is, well, what will happen if we train, for example, using the maximum likelihood KL, so the KL between the data and the model, and the reverse KL between the model and the data, because the KL divergence is not symmetric. And what we see here is that the behavior is very different. When we use the maximum likelihood KL, the objective, remember, is to be able to explain samples from our data, all the samples from our data. And if we sample from our original distribution, from our data distribution, we'll have samples here and samples here. And for a Gaussian distribution to explain both of these peaks, it will have to put mass all around them which means that, yes, it will be able to explain the data, but it's also going to have a lot of mass here, where actually we don't have any mass under the original distribution. On the other hand, if we use the reverse scale, this is not what we will see. What we will see is that the model is going to focus only on one of the modes. It's going to be able to explain that very well, but it's going to completely ignore the second mode. And if you then query your model to say, is it likely that data here comes from the original data distribution, it's going to wrongly answer no, because it's not able to capture anything about this mode. So even with this very simple example of one dimensional data, we can see the trade-offs of the kind of distribution that we choose. And that's going to guide us through as we go forward. So one natural question now might be, well, are GANs doing the divergence minimization? We talked about this two-player game on optimization between the discriminator and the generator. How is that connected to doing divergence minimization? And the original paper showed that, yes, it is connected. If the discriminator D is optimal, so if we've trained a perfect classifier to distinguish between samples from the data and samples from the model, then the generator G is minimizing the Jensen-Shannon divergence between the true and the generated distributions. And this is great because it also gives us this connection to optimality that we talked about before. Now, if the Jensen-Shannon between two distributions is zero, then the two distributions are the same. And now we want to understand a bit more about the Jensen-Shannon divergence. How does it behave, for example, in the case of the misspecified Gaussian when our original distribution is a mixture of two Gaussian? And the answer is that, well, it does a bit of maximum likelihood and a bit of the reverse scale because by definition, it is a mixture of the two. And in practice, the answer depends on how you initialize your model. So if you don't initialize your model too close of your two peaks, then it's going to do the maximum likelihood solution. Otherwise, if you initialize it very close, then it will revert to the reverse scale. However, in practice, the discriminator is not optimal. As we've seen from the algorithmic perspective, we often have limited computational resources. We can't train the discriminator to optimality every time we update the generator so that at each step, the generator is minimizing the Jensen-Shannon divergence. And even if we did, even if we would were to train D to optimality, given our data, we still, still don't have access to the true data distribution, just a few samples from it, our data set. So we will still not have a truly perfect discriminator. And we're going to see why that is important later on. But let's look at more properties of the KL and the Jensen-Shannon divergence. 
And here, for simplicity, I'm going to focus on explaining this on the Kale divergence. But the same can be said about the Jensen-Shannon. As we've seen, the Jensen-Shannon is a mixture of two Kales. And this property is important because this has really sparked the field to perhaps look beyond the Jensen-Shannon divergence, to look at other divergences that we can use to train GANs. And why is that? Well, we see here our example that we're going to run throughout is a case where we have two distributions with no overlapping support. So what do I mean by that? Here we have our data distribution in red. And our data distribution produces samples here. And its PDF is given by this truncated Gaussian here, um, shown also in red. And we have our model. And our model is also truncated Gaussian. And we have a few samples from it here. One thing that we observe is that there is no place in 1D where both of them assign non-zero probability. So the data only assigns non-zero probability here, but here the model says, well, this is not really likely under the model. And what happens in this case is that the KL divergence and the Jensen-Shannon are going to be constant. So the KL is going to be infinity and the Jensen-Shannon is going to be log 2. And why is that? Well, remember the KL divergence definition. It's the expected value under the true data distribution of a log ratio. And this log ratio is the ratio between the data distribution and the model. And if we look at, the, at this ratio under the data distribution, because this is our expectation, we see, well, we will have the probability of this data, this sample here, under the data distribution, which we can query is something obtained from here, divided by the probability distribution of the data under the model. This is where the problem comes from. This probability distribution is 0, because the model assigns 0 mass here. So this ratio is infinity, so our KL divergence is going to be infinity. And this is especially a problem from a learning perspective, because when we learn a model, we want to get rewarded if we do something good. right? So imagine the case where I've moved my model a little bit from here a bit closer to the data here. So this is good. The model is doing something good. It's going closer to my data distribution. And we would want the type of loss function that says, yeah, good job. You're going in the right direction. You're doing well. But the Kale and the Jensen-Shannon, they can't do that. Because th this property, that the ratio is still infinity here, still holds. You still, even though you've moved your model closer to the data, you're still at a point where this ratio is infinity because there's still no overlapping support. So this is why people thought, well, perhaps we should try to train GANs that are inspired by a different divergence. So the question is, can we choose another V for our min-max game? And will it correspond to a different distributional divergence? And to do that, we have to look at other divergences and distances and see whether we can somehow turn that into a game that you can we can use for our GAN train. And one very nice distance is the Wasserstein distance between two distributions. It looks slightly different than the KL. We already see that there's no ratio. We have a difference of expectations here. And a maximization. So just to estimate the divergence, we have to do a maximization. And this maximization has to be over one Lipschitz function. So one Lipschitz functions have to be relatively well, well behaved, which means that the difference from in absolute value of the function at two points has to be smaller or equal than the absolute value of the two points. So you can't grow too fast um, in a particular region. So this means that the function has to be relatively smooth. And here, when we maximize with respect to the set of functions, we're trying to maximize the difference in expectation of the expected value of the function under the data distribution minus the expected value after the function under the model. So let's look at an example here. This is our example from before, only that here we're not going to use the PDFs themselves, but we're going to use samples from the model. So these are our samples from our data distribution. These are our samples from our model. And we're trying to find the function f that can separate these expectations as much as possible. So here, we can see that we can put positive mass in the function f around the data distribution. Then this expectation is positive. Because we are we're sampling here, we are evaluating the function at all these points. All these points are positive. So this expected value is going to be positive. We do the same for, for the model. But here, the model 
under the model, the function is negative. So when we take the difference, the difference is going to be large. It's going to be something, a positive, a positive number minus a negative number. And importantly, the Wasserstein distance goes down now if we have a model that goes closer to the data, even when we don't have overlapping support. Because remember, this function has to be one Lipschitz. It can't grow too fast in a small neighborhood. So we're moving closer to the data. We have restricted the amount of growth that this function can have, and thus the difference in expectation is smaller. So we now have a distance that have this property that if we're doing the right thing, we're getting rewarded for it, which is great. Now, the question is, how do we turn this into a GAN? So we've talked so far about estimating Wasserstein distances, and we've seen that this itself involves an optimization over one Lipschitz functions. But what we're interested in, ideally, is in learning. How do we use this to learn a probability distribution or a model that can generate data from a probability distribution? So we have now our minimization with respect to our generator again. But now we want to do with respect to the Wasserstein distance. And if we just replace, so we keep the minimization in place, and we replace the definition of the Wasserstein distance that we've seen above, we have this form. And this form already looks very familiar. We have a minimization and a maximization. So if we think of our function now that learns to distinguish between data samples and model samples from an expectation perspective, rather from a ratio like we've seen before, then this function can be thought of as our discriminator. So now our minimization problem with respect to G stays the same but we have a maximization problem with respect to our discriminator, subject to the discriminator being well-behaved. And this loss function, this value function that looks different because we're no longer starting with a classification and we're no longer getting to the Jensen-Shannon divergence, but to the Wasserstein distance, but it's something that looks very similar, right? So now we have something that learns to distinguish between the data samples and the model, but in a Wasserstein sense. And we can use that to train again. And this is what's called Wasserstein GAN. And we can look at other divergences and distances. One of them is MMD, maximum mean discrepancy. And it looks very similar to the Wasserstein case, only that now the optimization is with respect to a different class of functions, cl functions that are part of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And if we look at the behavior of MMD on our standard example, we see that it does the same. The value of the function is positive under the data. The value of the function is negative under the model, only that the shape of the function looks different because we're now looking at a different family of functions to estimate our model. And just like in the case of the Wasserstein distance, we can try to turn this into a GAN. We have a supremum over a class of functions. We turn that into a maximization over our discriminator, only that now the discriminator has to be a part of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And we have the loss function as an expectation of the difference of expectations. And remember, we started talking about the KL divergence. We started with maximum likelihood as a very common objective of training. And KL divergence is a type of F divergence. And F divergences look like this. There's an expected value, an F, which is fixed. So we know this function for the KL, for example, and so on, and a density ratio. The problem here is that if we want to train something like a GAN inspired by F divergences, we will encounter issues because we don't have access to P of X. We don't have access to the probability distribution. So how do we get around this? Well, we can't just start training models using the F divergences, but we can find the variational lower bound on our F divergence objective and use that instead. So if you've seen VAEs before, variational autoencoders, there, there too we use a variational lower bound and we replace that in our training objective. And in this case, in the F divergence case, the variational lower bound is telling us to optimize this objective instead. And this objective now should look very similar. We have a supremum over class of functions. And we have a difference in expectations, only that now we also have the convex conjugate of the function f from here. 
that things are looking very, very similar to what we've seen before. And the optimal T here is actually the density ratio that we talked about before and that we saw that can cause problems in practice. And we're going to go back to this density ratio in a bit. But importantly, now because we have the same form that we've seen in the Wasserstein and MMD case, we can also turn this into a GAN. Just slightly different objective. Now we still have the convex conjugate effect here, but we can use this to train our model. So, so far, what we've seen is that we can train GANs using multiple criteria, which are inspired by multiple divergences and distances. We started with the original GAN that did the Jensen-Shannon divergence. Then we looked at the properties of the Jensen-Shannon divergence. And based on that, we looked at other distances and divergences that maybe have different properties. Those were Wasserstein and MMD. And at the end, we also asked the question, well, OK, but how about the KL divergence, something that's very used in practice? Can we train again inspired by the KL divergence? And the answer there was also yes. Now, one question that you might have is, why would I train again instead of doing divergence minimization if divergence minimization gives me all this uh, optimal convergence properties? And the answer is, well, it depends. In practice, you might not be able to do divergence minimization, or you might not want to do divergence minimization because GANs have some advantages. And we're going to talk about this now. So firstly, remember how we mentioned just now that the KL divergence requires knowledge of this model P of X, which we don't have in the case of implicit models, of models like GANs. So if we want to train a GAN inspired by the KL di divergence, we have to use FGANs. But now at least we can train models that don't have an explicit likelihood using the KL divergence, which is something that we couldn't do before. right? So by using GANs, we've expanded the class of models that we can train using KL divergence. There's also the computational intractability factor. We've talked about the Wasserstein distance and how just finding the value for the Wasserstein distance requires an optimization problem over a class of functions. But that is intractable for complex cases. So you wouldn't be able to do this at each iteration step to find the Wasserstein distance and then use that for training. But if you use the Wasserstein GAN, which now will have the same type of algorithmic implementation, as we've seen for the original GAN, update the discriminator a few times, two, three, four, five times, and then update the generator, then you can get around that. Yeah, you're not doing exact Wasserstein distance optimization anymore because you haven't solved this optimization problem. But you're still doing something inspired by the Wasserstein distance, but you can now train a model. And remember our problem with the smooth learning signal our problem with the KL divergence and the Jensen-Shannon, and how that inspired us to look at other distances and divergences. But perhaps that's not as big of a problem in the GAN case as we originally thought, this idea that it, they will not give you any signal to learn when there's no overlapping support between the data and the model. And why is that? Well, remember our example. The problem that we have is that this density ratio was infinity here. And that meant that if I move my model closer to my data, I'm still not getting any useful signal. But in the case of GANs, I'm approximating this ratio. So perhaps we're not going to have the same problems. So if we look empirically, we can see that GANs still learn. So in this paper, we show that if the data is here and the model is here, so at initialization, there's no overlapping support, and we train our GAN, the model, after a bit of training, still learns to match the data distribution. So why is that? Well, a simple way to think about this is, again, inspired by the KL divergence, because that's a simple divergence to look at. But similarly, we can think about the Jensen-Shannon. So if we look at the KL divergence, we look at its definition, again, we have this true ratio here that is problematic, right? Because this is why we're getting this problems with the KL divergence. But in the case where we train GANs, we actually use this lower bound instead. Remember when we talked about FGAN, we use the bound 
because we can't have access to p of x. But now we estimate this ratio using our discriminator and we ask our discriminator to be in a class of family of functions because we have to represent it somehow. So that's either a deep neural network or a function in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space and so on. And these functions are relatively smooth. So we're approximating our true ratio with something smooth. And what happens in practice is that these smooth functions won't be able to jump from zero to infinity or to represent infinity as the underlying ratio would. So our standard example, again, we have our data here, our model here. The true ratio here goes to infinity. It's zero everywhere else. But our NLP that is used to approximate our ratio will not go to infinity. It starts low and then it starts growing and growing and growing. It needs, it knows that it needs to be higher here, but it won't be infinity. And the nice thing about this is that if I move my model closer to my data, it will know because there's no jump of exactly here, you need to go to infinity. And this is similar if I use another function class to represent our ratio. So here, if we're using a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, we see the same type of behavior. Around the data, we're going to have a higher ratio, but it's not going to be infinity. And again, if I use my model closer to my data, then I'm going to get a useful learning signal that says, yeah, good job, you're going into the right direction. And this is why empirically we've seen that the GAN could learn, even though we initialize the models to not, to don't, to not have overlapping support. So the crucial idea here is that the discriminator is a smooth approximation to the decision boundary of the underlying divergence. And we've seen that with some experiments and with an explanation of what happens in the case of the KL divergence. So in practice, GANs do not do divergence minimization because the discriminator is not optimal. It doesn't really represent that true density ratio, for example. But this also means that GANs do not fail in cases where the underlying divergence would, like we've seen in the Jensen-Shannon case. And perhaps another way to think of discriminators is as learned distances. So the discriminator is providing a loss function to our generator, but it's something that itself is learned to provide useful gradients to our model. And this is the case both for the original GAN, the Wasserstein GAN, and so on. They all have this form, minimization with respect to G and maximization with respect to D of a value function. But if we think of this bit here, this is the loss function for G, but it's just trained. It's trained using the discriminator parameters. Now, the crucial bit here is that we can use this to tell the generator through our loss function what we actually care about. And the way we do that is by putting the right neural network features into the discriminator. So we know that if we're training data on images, we want to use convolutional neural networks because those are very good at distinguishing between images and learning the right features for that. If we're using audio, we might want to use recurrent neural networks and so on. So the crucial bit here is that we no longer just use neural network features in our model, but we also use it in our loss. And now the loss can provide additional signal to the model to focus on the right aspects of the data. And this is something that a true divergence, not the learned divergence, that this is not a distance or divergence in a mathematical sense, but this is able to provide you some useful learning signal that you maybe wouldn't get if you were using the KL divergence or something else. So to answer the question of, well, why would I want to do GANs as opposed to divergence minimization? Well, we see that GANs provide very good samples and they are using this learned loss function where you can have this additional knob to train, to tell your model what to focus on. But they're hard to analyze in practice. You have to think of game theoretical reasons and so on. And in practice, there are no optimal convergence guarantees because, again, the discriminator won't be optimal. However, if you do divergence minimization, there are optimal convergence guarantees and easy to analyze loss properties, but it's harder to get good samples. And the loss functions don't usually correlate with human evaluations because they focus on aspects pertaining to the statistical properties of the divergence rather than the modality of the data. 
So the take home message here is that in practice, GANs do not do divergence minimization. And the discriminator can be seen as a learned distance. It's something that is learned to distinguish between the data and the model samples and to provide useful learning signal to the generator. And one question that you might have is, well, which GAN should I use? We've talked about Wasserstein GAN, MMD GAN, the Jensen-Shannon GAN, that's the original GAN, and so on. And empirically, it has been observed that the underlying loss so the underlying divergence matters less than the neural architectures, the training regime, and the data. And I think if you're thinking of the importance, the importance of the features that the discriminator is learning and the convolutional or recurrent architectures uh, underlying them and the kind of information that provides to the generator, that's somewhat intuitive because now you're focusing really on the features that are useful at distinguishing between data and sound. And Jeff is going to tell you a lot more about this and give you plenty of examples of neural architectures that are used for, for GANs. And so far, we've talked about unconditional generative models. So far, we're asking our generator, generator, please generate a sample. I'm giving you some latent noise, generate something out of it. But we might want to have a knob to tune, and we might want to tell the generator, generator, please generate a cat or generator, please generate a dog, and so on. And for that, we have to change our model a little bit. So, so far, we've talked about deterministic deep neural networks that are able to transform Gaussian noise into data. But what we want now is to provide additional input to the generator to say, well, please generate a dog, or please generate a cat. And we often provide that in the form of one hot vector. If our conditioning information is a label, we're going to say 1, 0, 0, 0 for dog, 0, 1, 1 for cat, 0, 1, 0, 0 for cat, and so on. And this is going to tell the generator what it needs to generate. And the reason it will listen to that is because in practice, we also change how the discriminator is trained. And now the discriminator also knows that the generator should have generated a dog. And if it generates a cat, the, the generator is not going to get a good uh, loss for that. So now it has to listen to the conditioning information as well, because the discriminator training itself has also changed. And this, in practice, leads to better samples. And the, the big GAN model, for example, that I've shown, is able to generate very good, high quality samples on ImageNet is a class conditional. But sometimes when you train GANs, even class conditional GANs, you might get something like this. This is what's called mode collapse. So here the model, instead of capturing the diversity of the data, is now focused only on a few examples, a few faces, and it's generating them again and again. And what we would like is a way to automatically know whether our model has collapsed or not. We want to evaluate our samples without looking at them um, at every iteration and so on. And in practice, that's a bit hard because the generator loss is not something very interpretable. So often when you train our models, we're used to our loss going down smoothly. But because we have this two-player game here where the generator improves, the discriminator improves, and so on, the loss itself shown here doesn't really tell, tell us much. So there's been a lot of work um, trying to answer the question where, how can we evaluate GANs? And this is a very difficult question. Even answering the question broadly, how are we going to evaluate generative models, is extremely hard. So we have no metric currently that is able to capture all the desired properties that we want from our model. So some of these properties are sample quality. We want to be able to generate high quality samples, but we also want to be able to generalize. We don't just want our model to just give us samples from the original data, because for that, we could have just used a hash table and just say, give me a sample from the original data set. And as Irina and I are going to talk in another lecture, we're often also using these models for representation learning. And we might want to answer the question, how good is this scan at representation learning? Or how good is this VAE at representation learning? And so on. And perhaps what we actually want is to evaluate on the base goal. So what are we trying to do with this generative model? 
are we using it for semi-supervised learning? So are we using the features for classification? Then maybe we should use classification accuracy. Are we using it for reinforcement learning? Then maybe we should use the agent reward and so on. But in practice, because that is hard to do and also more expensive and complex, and it makes it harder to compare models, what people often use are log likelihoods. So you're asking your model to explain validation data that it hasn't seen. And based on that, you're assessing how good your model is. But GANs are implicit. So we're not able to use log likelihoods to evaluate our GANs. So people have come up with other metrics to try to understand how good our samples are. And one such metric is the inception score. So in the inception score, what we're trying to see is that the model is preserving the class ratio that we've seen in the data. So imagine that we have a data set that has 50% dogs and 50% cats. Then we want that our model in practice is also generating around 50% dogs and 50% cats. And notice here that inception score doesn't care about the individual dogs and the individual cats. They can all be the same. As long as on average, we get 50% cats and 50% dogs, inception score is happy. So the way this is done in practice is that we can use a pre-trained classifier, often on ImageNet, to compare the distribution of labels obtained from data with the distribution of labels obtained from samples in a KL divergent sense. And this metric is able to capture sample quality because if the model is generating garbage, you won't be able to get anything useful out of the pre-trained classifier. So the distribution of labels coming from samples is going to be very different than the distribution of labels coming from data. It's able to know whether you're fully dropping a class. So remember mode collapse, where we've seen that the model can focus on one or two aspects of the data. So if you're dropping cl classes, for example, you're not generating any cats, the inception score is going to penalize you for this. And it's also going to penalize you if you're generating a lot more dogs than cats, for example. It correlates well with human evaluation, but it doesn't really measure anything beyond class labels. So every, as we've seen, if you're generating the same dog again and again, inception score is going to be good. I'm happy. And because of this, people have looked at other metrics. For example, for Shea inception distance. And for Shea inception distance is not happy if you're generating the same dog again and again. Now it's looking both at the labels in terms of are we generating 50% cats and 50% dogs, but also inside the class. And the way it does that is by looking at features on a pre-trained classifier rather just than the output distribution of labels. So if we're comparing now, instead of a KL sense in a fresh air distribution, fresh air distance sense, the distribution of layer features obtained from the data and the distribution of layer features obtained from the model, now we're getting a more fine-tuned metric. So again, we can see sample quality because we're also using a pre-trained classifier. We're also able to see if we're dropping classes altogether because the features on average are going to look very different if we're only generating dogs and forgetting about cats. But it also goes beyond that and it captures higher level statistics. But there's a problem with this metric. It has been shown that it's biased for a small number of samples. And KID has been proposed as a fix in practice. And see this paper from uh, iClear 2018 for the, for the fix. But we also want to go beyond this. We want to make sure that our model has not overfitted and has not just memorized the data. We want generative models that are able to capture the essence of the underlying distribution and the statistical properties of the distribution, but generalize beyond that. And one way to check this is to check for the closest samples from our model sample in the data. But we don't want to do this in pixel space because that's very noisy and not really representative in a semantic sense. So again, just like we've seen with loss functions where we used features in our training or just as we do in our model, we're going to use neural networks features for evaluation. So again, we're using a pre-trained classifier and we're going to search not in pixel space, but in the feature space of this classifier for the closest images 
in our data set to our sample. So here we have an example of a sample from BigN, and we're answering the question, well, what are the most similar ImageNet samples from this uh, sample? And the answer is that, well, they are, um, they are data of dogs in ImageNet, but this exact dog does not exist in ImageNet. So we have dogs of the same color, different shapes, different sizes. We have dogs in green background, but this exact same dog does not exist in the data set. So the model has used the training and the data to learn how to generate dogs, but to generalize beyond what it's seen. And the take home message of this part is to remember that we need multiple metrics to evaluate GAN samples because we don't just care about sample quality, we also care about overfitting and so on. And with this, I'm going to hand it off to Jeff, who's going to talk to you about the GAN Zoo. Hi, I'm Jeff Donahue. Um, I'm a researcher at DeepMind, and I've been working on developing and improving adversarial networks at scale. I'm particularly interested in the application of GANs and other generative models for representation learning, a topic I'll be discussing a little bit later in this lecture. So now that Mihaela has given you an overview of the theoretical underpinnings of GANs, my goal for the rest of the lecture is to take you on a tour of the GAN Zoo to give you an idea of the kinds of things that people have been doing to improve these models from where they started to the state of the art now, and all the different domains and problem settings where these models are being applied. A lot of GAN research has focused on image synthesis. So we'll start by walking through the path that has taken us from applying GANs to small data sets like MNIST to large scale image databases like ImageNet. And a good place to start is the original GAN paper from Ian Goodfellow and his collaborators. In this paper, they used relatively simple data, like the MNIST digits that are referred to in the title of this part of the lecture, and other data sets like this FACES data set and the CIFAR data sets. Um, but they're all pretty small images with resolutions of about 32 by 32 or smaller. In this paper, they used relatively simple models. In fact, for these top two images that you see here, the, the models were multi-layer perceptrons, or MLPs. So they weren't convolutional, and they treated the images as flat vectors, completely ignoring the spatial structure of the images. So there's essentially no inductive biases in these models. And when you have data that's as relatively simple as this, that turns out to work pretty well. Uh, you can see that the kind of digits that you get are relatively convincing imitations of the real digits you see highlighted in yellow here. Um, these are the kind of digits that you can generate with these kinds of models. So it worked reasonably well, but it was mostly just a proof of concept that this sort of model could work at all. And it wasn't really meant to be a demonstration of everything these kinds of models were capable of, which we'll get to later. So moving on from that, an extension that you can do to these models, as Mihaela mentioned in her part of the talk, is to make them conditional on a class label. This early work on GANs called conditional GANs generalizes GANs to the conditional setting where we have some extra information associated with each piece of data, um, such as a category ID in this case. Um, and instead of a category ID, this could be something as complicated as an image in another domain, although in this work, the conditioning was just a category ID like cat or dog. Um, so when you do this on MNIST with the 10 digit labels, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you get results like this, where um, every row is in different conditioning, in this case, a digit label. Um, and it turns out uh, when you give it a 2 as the label, it produces results that look like a 2, which so it's great. This works. Um, next, uh, we're going to look at some early work that actually managed to tackle some pretty high resolution images with GANs. Um, there's this work called LAPGAN by Emily Denton and her collaborators. Um, so this work was really cool for a couple of reasons, but just to give you an idea of what it does in terms of the generation process, um, basically they'll start from a tiny image, like a 4x4 or 8x8 image, and they'll upsample it uh, via Gaussian style upsampling. Um, so that gives you a blurry image at a twice as large resolution. And from there, what you can do to get a final image um, is you generate the Laplacian. So basically, uh, so you can see if you go from this image here, this tiny image, point to, uh, to uh, this image, 
um, all you have to do is some trivial upsampling operation, but then to actually fill in the details, um, you have to produce the Laplacian, which is the difference between the blurry image and the final higher resolution image. Um, so you can add these up to get the final higher resolution image, the blurry image plus the Laplacian. So the discriminator's job is to take both the blurry high resolution image and the difference image, um, either the real one or the generated one, and decide whether that pair of images is real or generated. Um, so this was a really interesting formulation for a couple of reasons, in that it sort of uh, decomposes the problem down to a multi-step generation process with uh, multiple discriminators and de generators, each one operating at a different resolution. And the discriminators and generators are also conditional as you have um, the same piece of conditioning information, uh, this blurry image that we're interested in upsampling. So what you have in the end is this recursive way of going from a small image to a high resolution image. Um, so this was pretty exciting at the time, especially because it was the first GAN paper to produce relatively high resolution and convincing images. Um, and one of the other nice things was that it's not a deterministic upsampling. So you can see on this slide, it's not producing the same high resolution image for each um, resolution input image on the left. It's actually producing a full distribution of high resolution images for each low resolution image. Um, so you have this tiny starting image on the left and you upsample, upsample, upsample with the GAN until you get to um, 64 by 64 resolution or whatever. And because it's using random noise at each stage, um, as you have in any standard GAN, you wind up with a slightly different high resolution output, um, whatever um, tiny input image you started with every time you resample the noise, which is what you want if you have a um, properly trained and generalizing GAN. Um, another cool thing architecturally is that this was a fully convolutional generator. So it's taking a blurry, say, 32 by 32 images input and maintaining that 32 by 32 resolution throughout the network to produce a 32 by 32 Laplacian as output. And a nice thing about that is it allows you to apply the generator to actually any resolution, although it's only going to work really well at the resolution you trained it on. So for example, in this case, they um, only trained it on up to 32 by 32 images, but you can keep reapplying this recursive upsampling and Laplacian generation operation um, with the highest resolution generator that you trained. And then in the end, if you keep doing this, you get what looks like, uh, continues to look like higher resolution images, although it's obviously it's a little bit blurry and not necessarily the best fidelity, but you can't really expect too much more uh, when the model's only ever seen 32 by 32 images. Moving on to this paper called Deep Convolutional GANs or DC GANs um, from Alec Radford and his collaborators. Um, so this was another really exciting paper at the time because it was a very simple architecture. It was basically very similar to the original um, GAN framework, but with deeper convnets. And it used uh, batch normalization, which made this sort of uh, notoriously difficult um, GAN training process uh, much smoother than it was without batch normalization. Um, the two networks, the generator and the discriminator, were both convnets. So the generator was a deconvnet or an upsampling convnet, and the discriminator was a downsampling convnet. And it's basically a five-ish layer network, not too dissimilar from something like AlexNet at the time. So when you apply DC GANs to a data set of indoor scenes, you get results that look like this, which were, at the time at least, uh, quite impressive and exciting. And um, one of the cool things that you can do with a network that's trained this way is you can take um, two noise or two Z samples, Z1 and Z2 on the slide. For example, one of them might produce an image of a desk that looks like this, and one of them might produce an image of a bed that looks like this. Um, and then you can interpolate between these two Zs in Z space. And at every point in between, you get what looks like a relatively realistic and semantically meaningful result. So of course, it's not perfect. But one thing that this shows is that the model is able to properly generalize. So it's able to turn a data set of 100,000 or 10,000 discrete examples into a continuous distribution of images. And this also showed that the model isn't simply memorizing the data set, because obviously, um, in the data set, you wouldn't have an example of any um, interpolation for any given pairs of images in the data set. And this is what happens if you do that same kind of interpolation thing for faces. Again, obviously, it's not perfect. And there's some kind of uh, creepy looking uh, results in this case, but um, it's still interesting. Um, one really interesting observation from this work is that there appear to be some um, meaningful semantics in the latent space. Um, so basically, um, in this uh, sort of example, they observed that if you take a latent that produces a man with glasses for, from a pre-trained GAN model, um, and another latent that produces a man without glasses, and another latent that produces a woman without glasses, and you do man with glasses minus man plus women, you get a woman with glasses 
Um, and that might remind you a little bit of the uh, word to vec results for language embeddings, if you're familiar with that work. Um, but what this shows for GANs is that there are directions in this uh, DC GAN latent space that correspond to the presence or absence of glasses, as well as the gender of the subject, which is not something that the model is ever explicitly trained to do. It's just sort of um, learned to sort these semantic properties and represent them in the latent space in some way, which is uh, really interesting. Um, we'll talk more about that later. Jumping ahead a little bit, there was a paper in 2018 called Spectrally Normalized GANs from Miato and collaborators. And this was uh, really exciting too, as it was the first real crack at using a single GAN, a single generator, and a single discriminator um, to model this ImageNet data set with 1,000 classes and 1.2 million images. Um, the main trick in this paper was intended to stabilize uh, GAN training by clamping the singular values of the discriminator weights to one. Um, so that all the weights in the network had a singular value of one, which basically means that um, no matter what the input to a layer is, the output magnitude is not increased. Um, and the way it's implemented is every time you run the discriminator's forward pass, you calculate an estimate of the first singular value for each layer. And because um, this is a linear thing, you can just rescale the weight, as shown here, by dividing by its singular value um, to get a normalized version of the weights with spectral norm one. Um, so this regularizes the discriminator, and they're actually using here essentially a linear loss function, the hinge loss in this case. So if you didn't have this regularization, the discriminator could basically improve its objective just by increasing the magnitude of its weights. Um, but because you do have the spectral norm regularization, the discriminator has to improve its objective in ways that actually uh, meaningly improve the gradient signals that it passes uh, back to the generator, which is what we want out of a discriminator. <clears throat> So when this is applied to ImageNet, you get images that look like this, which at the time was uh, particularly impressive because nobody had successfully taken on the full ImageNet data set with a single GAN before. Um, in some follow-up work from the, uh, the same group, um, they added this idea of a projection discriminator to handle conditioning. So previously, they used the kind of input conditioning we saw before, where you would feed in the class label like pizza as uh, the input to the very first layer. Or there were this other uh, variant called AC GANs, or auxiliary classifier GANs, where you would train the discriminator as a classifier directly. Um, so what this paper proposed to do is called a projection discriminator. Um, so they're learning a class embedding, which is the same uh, dimension as the uh, discriminator's last hidden layer. And they project the class embedding onto the hidden representation, or dot product it. And that gives you a class conditional realness score. Um, that the discriminator outputs. So basically, basically, rather than feeding the label as an input, it becomes an output in this case. And uh, there's a pretty interesting uh, theoretical justification based on the um, underlying probabilistic model that justifies uh, doing it this way. And it not only um, makes sense theoretically, but performs very well empirically. And you see results that look like this, um, which was uh, even more impressive than the results we saw with um, SNGAN alone. Um, one more pretty interesting innovation in the GAN architectural space was what's called self-attention. And self-attention is that this technique for giving uh, networks the ability to do some sort of global reasoning. Um, it's been applied in a lot of domains, especially in language modeling and machine translation. Um, in the image domain, it allows you to basically learn to measure global statistics about the image. Um, so for example, so this was used in both the generator and the discriminator. And for example, if you're the discriminator, um, you might want to be able to ask questions like, if the tail of the dog is on the left side of the image, um, is the face of the dog on the right side of the image? Um, which is something you might want to know if you want to tell whether the image is real or fake. And you couldn't typically, typically do something like that with a single convolutional layer, because the kernels are just too small to capture that much of the image. Um, so this resulted in. Um, better global coherence across the images that the GAN would generate. Um, and they also have these nice qualitative results to visualize what uh, the model ends up looking at. So for example, in this case, it looks like the model decided to um, compare this area around the head of the dog um, to this area near the tail of the dog to make sure you know that all the dog's body parts are kind of in the right place, um, which you can imagine how that would help the generator learn to produce images with better global coherence. And then at the end of the day, you get results that look like this on the ImageNet data set, which again was another advance, both uh, qualitatively and quantitatively in terms of inception score um, compared to the previous results that we've seen. <clears throat>
Um, so finally, we get to this project from our group at DeepMind called Big GAN, led by Andy Brock. Um, the main idea of this work, um, which I think I'm allowed to say because I was co a co-author on this paper, um, was to make GANs really, really big. Um, and we wanted to do a big empirical study and sort of digest all of the image GAN research that's been done so far and uh, scale them up as much as we could and just kind of see where it would take us. So yeah, uh, big GANs, we had um, big, big batches, big models, big data sets, big high resolution images. Um, so the batch size that we used for our main results was 2048 compared to batch sizes of roughly 256 that were being used before our work. And this turned out to be um, a particularly important hyperparameter, which is really critical to making uh, these models work as well as they did. Um, and uh, one hypothesis for why this might have been so important is that the ImageNet dataset has 1,000 classes. And if you're doing mini-batch SGD, especially in a setting that's as unstable as GAN training still can be, um, you really want, ideally, each class to be represented in each batch so that the model doesn't end up sort of forgetting about classes that it hasn't seen in a while. Um, and so if you have a batch size of 2048, it's fairly likely that in any given batch, almost all of the 1,000 classes will appear. Whereas, obviously, if you have a batch size of 256, it's obviously impossible for a thousand, all 1,000 classes to be in that batch. Um, so we not only trained on ImageNet, but also this internal Google dataset called JFT, which has uh, 300 million images. Um, so we sort of used ImageNet as our development data set when designing these models throughout the course of the research. And then we directly applied the same models to JFT. And we found that they worked pretty well there, even on our data set, which was um, you know, 200, 200 or 300 times larger. Um, so you can see on the right uh, the type of images we get from this kind of model. And another few of them are here. Um, and so overall, this paper was a really big empirical study to build up a reliable kind of recipe for large-scale GAN training. So we inherited quite a few tricks from prior work, but uh, we like to think that you can be confident that each one was ablated really well and turned out and really turned out to be the best choice in terms of the image fidelity and the quantitative scores that you get. So um, among these tricks, we had the hinge loss, which is basically a linear loss, except it sort of uh, clamps to a minimum value when the discriminator is, or a maximum value, when uh, minimum value when the discriminator is correct and sufficiently confident in its correctness. And uh, spectral norm, which we just discussed, as well as uh, self-extension and projection discriminators. And finally, some tricks that we added to the toolbox relative to previous work um, included uh, orthogonal regularization, um, which sort of enforces that each row of the weights is orthogonal, that they're kind of doing different things. Um, and we used uh, skip connections from the noise. So basically, there was a direct connection from the noise Z to every layer in the generator's uh, convolution stack. And uh, similarly, for the class label embedding in the generator, we used uh, we learned an embedding that was shared across the different layers, um, each layer, again, having a direct connection from the class conditioning as well. Um, one interesting trick that we introduced was, with this paper was what we called the truncation trick. Um, it's an inference time trick, so it doesn't affect training at all. It's something that you can do with any pre-trained generator at inference time when you uh, want to go produce samples. So basically, we can change the standard deviation of the noise input to the generator, basically change the scale of the noise distribution, as you can see in the figure here. So it's sort of shrinking closer and closer to zero. Um, so if you watch the animation, we start with this you know, wide distribution. Um, and the resulting images produced for each class at the beginning of this animation, like now, um, are quite different. But as the distribution gets skinnier, the images become more and more uniform for a given class. So basically, what this does um, is when you make the distribution really small near zero, is it gives going to give you kind of a prototypical or a modal example of each class. Um, and in this case, for the dot for these dogs, it's typically a very well centered and camera facing um, example of each dog, which is sort of um, inherited from the biases of the data sets, because most people, you know, will take pictures of their dogs when they're facing the camera. Um, whereas if you keep the noise as it was at training time, uh, as you can see here, with uh, sigma equals one for the for the Gaussian input to the generator. Um, you get quite a bit more variety. So the truncation trick is really a way to trade off between the variety and the fidelity of the samples that you can generate um, with these models. Um, and yeah, here's just another example of what happens with the truncation trick for some bugs, some butterflies. Kind of the same thing as we saw for the dogs. 
So as I said, the truncation trick is really a way to trade off between um, variety and fidelity. So what you can do is compute the inception score and the FID at every point along this curve of sigma values that you can produce via the truncation trick. Um, so as Pahaley explained earlier when uh, she was talking about evaluating GANs, um, the inception score doesn't care really about how diverse the samples you produce are in each uh, class. It really just cares how good the samples are for each class, how confident it is in the classifications for each class. So if you just want to maximize inception score, setting the scale to roughly zero um, is uh, really the best thing you can do. And when you do that, you see that you end up maximizing inception score down at this point on the curve here at around uh, 210 in this case. Um, but when you do that, you have relatively bad FID of, of 30 plus, and higher is worse for FID. Um, on the other hand, if you leave um, sigma equals 1 on the other end of the curve here, the, which is the default Z distribution as it was at training time, you get relatively bad inception scores, uh, roughly 105 or 110, um, but very good FIDs as you're capturing more of the in interclass distribution, which FID is a little bit better at measuring. Um, so as so kind of as an alternative and more detailed way to evaluate GANs, you can look at this full truncation curve, um, whereas previous work had just looked at um, individual points using the de default distribution. So it sort of gives you a full frontier of the inception scores and FID scores across this entire curve. Um, one more thing that we played with sort of late in this work was uh, this different architecture called Big GAN Deep um, that you see here. So this is a deeper yet more efficient architecture um, you can see in a single block, it has twice as many convolutions in the main block. So there's four of them instead of two, and we had twice as many of these blocks in the big GAN deep architecture. So overall, it's four times as deep. Um, the key thing that makes this uh, uh, even more efficient than the original big GAN is that we have these, um, it's not a new idea, but um, we added these one by one convolutions that go to a lower channel count. And then these three by three convolutions operate on this um, lower channel count uh, space. So it all ends up at the end of the day, uh, and the three by three convolutions are the most expensive part. So it all ends up being a little bit more efficient than the original architecture. And the nice part is it also performs better with inception scores of over um, 240 at full truncation down here. And FID is around uh, six with the minimal truncation. Um, now, this model is uh, definitely not perfect. And a lot of times, the failures are kind of fun to look at as well. So for example, this image on the left that we um, sort of affectionately refer to as dog ball. Um, and this is an example of what we call class leakage. So according to Big Gan, this image is an example of a tennis ball. Um, so the reason that we think this happens for ImageNet specifically is that there are just so many dogs in the ImageNet data set. There are roughly 100 dog classes. So the model is sort of very accustomed to seeing dogs, and it sees them roughly 100 times as often as tennis balls. So when it sees tennis ball, it says, you know, hey, this, that's fuzzy. It's probably a dog. I'm going to put some eyes and a snout on it. Um, so this happens at least some point in training, and it's not actually from the final converged model, but it's kind of fun to see what happens as the model is learning to generate better and better in images throughout, better and better images throughout training. <clears throat> And uh, other failure modes include classes that are difficult, um, particularly any class that includes a human face. Now, it uh, could be a little bit just that they seem particularly bad, because humans are very sensitive to how good human faces look or how realistic they look. So there's kind of this uncanny valley effect, um, although we're quite a bit off here. I think you'd probably agree. Um, and classes with really complex structure, like the image of this band here, are also really hard with a lot of when they have a lot of different objects in the scene, and classes that are um, underrepresented in the data set and have also have complicated structure, like this image of a, um, I think it might be a tuba or a French horner. Um, and it's just really hard for the model to capture this sort of uh, complex structure without uh, too many examples, and especially to generalize uh, to uh, new instances of the class, as you're sort of asking um, the GAN to do. Some more recent uh, follow-up work that we did is this work called Logan, or Latent Optimization GANs. Um, so latent optimization is this idea intended to improve the um, adversarial dynamics of the GAN game between the generator and the discriminator. And basically what it does is it uses what's called the natural gradient descent to optimize G's latent inputs, um, the Z's. So it changes the Z's at training time to make the discriminator happier. So it does um, one natural gradient descent step inside of the training loop um, to change Z. And it actually is going to backprop through this entire process 
Um, so it's a little bit more expensive than a standard GAN. It takes about um, roughly twice as much computation time per step, but it results in really signif signif significant improvements in big GAN um, in terms of the variety and the fidelity that you can get. And it's particularly noticeable when you compare along the truncation curve. So for example, if we truncate such that the inception score is roughly uh, 259, you get much better FIDs when you train using low GAN than with a standard big GAN deep. Um, so both so low GAN is uh, about FID eight versus big GAN deep uh, about 28 at the same point. And it's obvious also, if you just look at the samples um, at this point in the um, truncation curve, big GAN deep is basically producing all uniform samples per class, whereas Logan still has uh, pretty uh, diverse samples. Um, so a parallel line of work to the big GAN work in all of the ImageNet work was this line of work from NVIDIA. Um, the first uh, work in the series was called Progressive GANs. Um, the idea of this was sort of similar to what they did in LapGAN, although it's formulated quite a bit differently. So um, the idea here is both for efficiency and to get the model to converge dependably, they start off generating at a very low resolution, like a 4x4 resolution. And then after your tiny image generator has converged, you can add an extra upsampling layer, like you see here, um, and a few extra convolutional refinement layers to get an 8x8 image generator if you start with 4x4. Um, then you wait for that one to converge. Uh, you repeat for 16 by 16, 32 by 32, and so on and so on until you get up to the final resolution that you would like to generate. In their case, they went to very high resolutions of up to uh, 1024 by 1024. And in the end, this resulted in uh, extremely compelling images, at least in this restricted domain of celebrity human faces. Um, and you get what looks like pretty much photorealistic results of human faces at this very high resolution of 1024 by 1024. You know, at least for me, it's very hard to tell the difference um, between most of these faces and real human faces. The follow-up work from this team was called style GANs. So style GANs were also shown to be capable of generating uh, remarkably photorealistic face images. And in this case, they used what was probably a more challenging data set uh, than the last one with a lot more variation in the images. Um, the data set they used in the previous work, progressive GANs, was mostly images of celebrities, whereas this data set was a lot of, uh, a lot more diverse and con mostly consisted of, consisted of images of not so famous people. Um, so the interesting thing about the architecture that they used in this work was that it had these structured latent inputs. So they had these uh, uh, the usual global latents, uh, the usual Zs uh, that you have as inputs to, gen to the generator, but they also had these spatial noise inputs. So you can see in the image that each column has sort of the same global structure or global semantics. Um, like this middle column, uh, for example, seems to be a latent corresponding to you know, young children. Um, and this column seems to correspond to being centered on the right side of the image and looking towards the center. And that's because each column uses the same global latent, whereas the spatial latent is the same in each row. Um, and it seems to mainly control, in this case, the sort of uh, background uh, of the image as well as the uh, skin tone. Um, so what the architecture looks like um, is on this slide. Um, so on the left, we have the usual uh, flat vector Z, which they explicitly called the latent. Um, and it's passed through a sequence of eight fully connected layers, an MLP, to get the final latent vector down here. And then this latent is input into every hidden layer of the generator. Um, but the interesting new piece here is that they also have these pixel noise inputs over here. Uh, so at every layer, you have a single channel of random noise of the appropriate resolution, so 4 by 4 8 by 8 and so on and so on. <clears throat> and that noise is going to get reincorporated at each of these layers. And as we saw before, it ends up using this global latent to control the overall global appearance of the image, while these pixel noise latents are used to control the local variation of the image. And another example of what this looks like in action is on this slide. So if you freeze the global latents and the coarse level pixel noise, if you freeze all of those, um, you can change just the fine high resolution pixel noise to get stochastic variations, you know, in this case, controlling sort of the fine differences in how this toddler's hairs uh, look. Um, so I hope that uh, what you can take away from this part of the talk is a, cu a couple of things. Um, first, there's been pretty rapid progress in the span of about five years, scanning, scaling up GANs from the MNIST digit images uh, that we saw in the original GAN paper to these pretty large scale databases of high resolution images like ImageNet and the Flickr Faces HQ dataset. 
And the improvements occurred really in a variety of different places. It wasn't just about changing the architecture or changing the objective. It was really all of these things combined. The G and D architectures have gotten better and deeper. Um, the conditioning structure has changed. Uh, the normalization has improved. We saw that batch normalization and spectral normalization were uh, quite helpful. Uh, the parameterization of the discriminator has changed. Um, we started off taking the conditioning vector as input. And now uh, with the projection discriminator, we project the class embedding onto the hidden representation of the image. Um, the latent space structure has changed. For example, in the style GAN paper, where we had the pixel noise latents to control local appearance. Um, the loss functions have changed, which we saw more in Michaela's part of the lecture. And the algorithms have changed, for example, in Logan, where we have an inner optimization of the latents. Um, but while we can produce some pretty convincing image, I'd say the problem is still uh, pretty far from solved. For example, these state-of-the-art methods take a good amount of time and quite a bit of computation to converge. And even with big GANs, you know, we're still not great at every single image category. So I hope this gives you a good idea of how the research has taken shape into what the state of the art is today, and you know, maybe even inspires you to try your own ideas and make these methods work even better. So next, I want to talk about an application of GANs that I'm particularly interested in, which is the use of GANs for representation learning. Um, you'll hear a lot more about the topic of unsupervised representation learning in the next lecture from Mihaela and Irina. Um, but for now, I'm going to address a few of the directions that people have been thinking about in terms of using GANs, in particular for representation learning. Um, so just to give a couple of motivating examples for why it might be interesting to use GANs for representation learning, this is a slide that we saw before. But just to remind you, so in the DC GAN work, um, Alec Radford and collaborators noticed that, that in the latent space of a deep convolutional GAN or DC GAN, you can do these kind of uh, arithmetic operations in latent space, indicating that certain directions in latent space correspond to high-level semantic attributes in the observation space, in this case, um, human faces, such as the presence or absence of glasses or the gender of the subject. And all of this arises without the GAN ever being explicitly told, without, uh, without ever being explicitly told about these concepts of um, glasses or gender. As another motivating example, I took the big GAN architecture, and I added an extra latent variable to the generator input. Um, so this is a categorical latent variable with 1,024 outcomes, and it's just uh, fed into the generator as a one-hot variable in conjunction with a regular continuous latent variable, the 120 degaussian. And the kind of things that you get out of this are pretty interesting. So I trained this without uh, class information. It's unsupervised and unconditional. Um, but it does have this, this categorical latent variable in place of the usual explicit class label that you'd get in the conditional supervised setting. Um, so it seems to learn to associate this categorical variable with high-level semantic groupings um, that almost look like image categories. So on this slide, you see about eight sort of randomly chosen outcomes of the 1,000-way categorical variable. And for example, in this uh, one value of this categorical variable shown in the first row um, corresponds to what looks like uh, C anemones. Another one uh, uh, looks like a certain breed of dog on a sort of grassy green background. Um, another looks like these kind of uh, mountainous uh, landscapes. Um, so this is uh, really cool. And you can imagine that in a sort of idealized case, the dream might be that it learns a clustering all on its own that looks exactly like, uh, say, the 1,000 ImageNet categories. Or at least each of these categories uh, might be represented by some combination of these categorical variable outcomes. Um, and if that were to happen, then training a model that could predict this latent variable given an image would be exactly like training a fully supervised ImageNet classifier. And of course, all of this came for free because it's unsupervised. So it's not like the ImageNet data set where we had to manually label each of the images with its category ID or you know, pay somebody to do that. Um, so going towards that dream, there have been many attempts to get models that fulfill this promise of learning representations using GANs completely unsupervised. And I'll dis discuss just a couple of them here. Um, one of the first uh, interesting papers from a few years ago was called InfoGANs, or Information Maximizing GANs. And compared to regular GANs, it adds this infer inference network to recover the latent code Z, given the generator output G of Z which in this set of experiments that we're looking at is an, Im an image of an MNIST digit. And what this does is force the generator to use each of its input latent variables meaningfully in order to maximize the information content about the variables in the images that it outputs. 
And when you train it with these latent codes, it learns to associate each outcome of the categorical latent variable with a different uh, digit value. And uh, it uses the continuous valued variables to vary the style and the size and the rotation of the digit. Um, so it basically is using the discrete latent to capture the discrete variation in the data set and the continuous latent to represent the continuous variation in the data set. So that's pretty cool. Um, so one uh, sort of disadvantage of this approach when it comes to representation learning is that you don't have a ground truth um, latent associated with real images like you do for generated images. So the inference network that you've added here is only ever getting to see generated images where you have uh, where you do have the latent. Um, and so that might be okay for representation learning when you have a very simple data set uh, like MNIST where the generator is able to capture it almost perfectly, um, like you can kind of see on this slide. But when you go to something more complex like ImageNet, if your generator isn't perfect, and it probably won't be because ImageNet is still really hard, if your generator isn't perfect, then when you go to apply the learned representations trained on these generated images, there's going to be kind of a domain shift between the generated images that the inference network has seen um, versus the real images that you want to get uh, feature representation for. So then comes this other class of methods that was called either adversarially learned inference, ALI, or bidirectional GANs or bigans. And this is sort of an adversarial approach to jointly learning to generate data and learn representations from it. Um, so compared to a regular GAN, the setup adds an encoder network, which we'll call E for most of this, um, which learns the inverse mapping from the generator G. So whereas the generator maps um, from features or latents to images G of Z, the encoder does the opposite. It matches from images or data X to latents E of X. And the other difference from a regular GAN is you have a joint discriminator. So it sees not only an image or a data point X or G of Z, but it also sees the latent Z or E of X. So these X, Z tuples can either come from taking a data point X and passing it through the encoder to get a predicted latent E of X, or it comes from sampling a latent Z and passing it through the generator to get a, an image G of Z. And then the discriminator's job here is to figure out which of the two generating processes each of its input tuples came from. And the generator and encoder's job are to fool the discriminator, basically, into picking the wrong uh, process. Um, and it might be a little confusing when you first look at this, because it's not entirely clear what the jet encoder's job is. Like, why does it have to produce anything in particular for a given x? Um, so, well, it turns out that under this objective of discriminating between these two different types of tuples, there's a global optimum here where if you have a perfect discriminator and the generator and encoder are perfectly satisfying the discriminator, then it turns out that the encoder and generator have to invert one another. So if you pass uh, an X, an image, through the encoder and get a predicted latent E of X, and then you pass that back through the generator, it should perfectly reconstruct the input X. That's the global optimum of this um, model. And um, unlike in, say, autoencoders, where you're explicitly training for this property by minimizing a squared error, in this case, the encoder and the generate communicate uh, don't communicate at training time. So they, they never see each other's outputs. Um, it's all done through the, the joint discriminator. So the encoder never sees the outputs of the generator, and the generator never sees the outputs of the encoder. Um, so one thing that makes this interesting for feature learning is that the encoder never suffers from the domain shift problem I mentioned before of see, having to see these kind of weird, bad, or at least initially bad generated images that the generator gives you. It only ever sees real data, which is exactly what we want for representation learning because it means that there's no domain shift when we go to apply the encoder to real images. Um, so in practice, this inversion property that we proved to be true at the global optimum um, doesn't actually hold perfectly, but uh, what you see is that the reconstructions that you get from passing x through the encoder and the result back through the generator often capture quite interesting semantics of the inputs. So for example, if we look at the digits here, often the digit identity between the original data x and the reconstruction g of x um, is the same. Um, so for example, you know, 2 goes to 2, 3 goes to 3, et cetera, et cetera. So what that tells you is that the representation the encoder gives you is capturing the digit identity, at least to some extent. And this is all just from looking at the data. We never explicitly tell it what a 5 looks like, and so on. Um, so if you scale these models up, because um, the original work uh, we just looked at was sort of at the DC GAN scale, if you apply this in the big GAN setting, uh, where you have the same generator and discriminator architectures as in big GAN, 
um, and you add an encoder model, which is something like a state-of-the-art recognition image recognition model, um, like a resonant style model, at least a few years ago, um, some very interesting things happen. Um, and we call these uh, resulting models with a few other tweaks that you can read about in the paper. Um, we call them big bigands, naturally. Um, so for example, if you pass this dog through the big bigand encoder and back through the generator to get a reconstruction, um, the reconstruction that you get is what looks like a pretty similar dog, although with its tongue stuck out and kind of facing in a slightly different direction. Um, this person in a red coat in the winter becomes a slightly more zoomed in person in a red coat in the winter. Um, so in general, many of these semantic properties of the input get maintained in the reconstructions, even though the model is never told what semantic properties are interesting. And um, all of this is happening because the structure of the discriminator is essentially shaping an implicit reconstruction error metric in semantic ways. At least this is kind of my intuition for what's going on. Um, so th the discriminator is a convolutional network, and we know that convolutional networks are good at predicting semantic attributes of images. Um, so the resulting implicit that reconstruction error that we're minimizing, um, implicitly, not explicitly, mind you, but, um, but this sort of implicit reconstruction error emphasizes the semantics remaining the same, even if the individual pixel values change quite a lot. So for example, the model isn't going to remember exactly what kind of pizza you gave it, but it will, will remember it was some kind of pizza and it was roughly in this part of the image. Um, so it's almost kind of human-like in terms of what it remembers about the input image. It has this sort of um, fuzzy semantic memory of what it saw without, for example, having to remember you know, the exact position of every single blade of grass. And this is in contrast to the standard pixel-wise reconstruction objectives where it's basically forcing the model to remember every single pixel value. Um, so this is, in some sense, exactly what we want in a re representation learning objective, which is um, what, at least you know, in my opinion, makes this an interesting method. And uh, when you uh, um, evaluate this quantitatively in this sort of standard setup where you basically take the encoder and use it as a feature representation and train a linear classifier supervised on top of that, you get something pretty close to state-of-the-art results compared to all of these uh, self-supervised methods that are very popular these days and which we'll, I think, hear about in the next lecture. And um, another way to see what representations are being learned by this method is by looking at nearest neighbors in the data set. So you can take images from the validation set as queries in this left, shown in this left-hand column here and find the training set images that are closest to them in big bigan feature space. So in general, you can see that the nearest neighbors tend to be very semantically relevant to the input image. In fact, uh, you know, with this dog from the validation set here, um, its nearest neighbor in the training set shown here, uh, I think based on the background, it's in fact exactly the same dog, even though it's obviously facing a different direction. And if you just looked at the pixel values, this would be quite different. So it's kind of cool that um, out of 1.28 million images in the training set, that ended up being the nearest neighbor, um, that same dog. Uh, at a different angle, although it's probably a little bit lucky, but still fun. Um, finally, for the last part of the talk, I just want to give you a taste of some of the other modalities and the different problem settings that people are trying to tackle using generative adversarial networks. So starting with a couple of these in the image space, one of the coolest lines of work, in my opinion, started with this paper called um, picks to picks by Philly Sola and his collaborators. And what they did in this uh, setting was train a generator to translate between images from two different domains. So for example, if you had satellite images like these and you wanted to be able to automatically translate these images to kind of roadmap type images like you see here. Um, and the way that uh, they do this in picks to picks is you take all of these paired examples of images. So the satellite image view and the corresponding map view of the same area. And you train a conditional GAN that takes the aerial view as an input and produces the map view as an output. So the way you train this thing is you have a standard GAN objective. You have a discriminator that says, does the output of the generator uh, look like a map view that I've seen before? Um, but you also have this uh, L1 reconstruction error. So since you have a ground truth for what this aerial or this map view is supposed to look like, um, you, uh, you can use this kind of L1 pixelized reconstruction error to tell the generator that this is exactly what your output should look like for this input. So basically, it's kind of like a traditional supervised uh, learning setup. And you can see that this works in a number of domains. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, 
labels to street scenes, um, edges to photographic images of purses, for example. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so it's uh, quite cool. Um, but in the more general setting, you might not actually have paired examples. So for example, um, if you want to train a GAN that translates between images of horses at, to zebras or vice versa, you're probably not going to have paired images where all the horses and all the zebras are in the exact same uh, positions in the image like we assumed we had in the pix to pix work that we just talked about. Um, so enter this method called CycleGAN, where you want to be able to sort of unsupervised uh, be able to translate between two different domains, with, but without paired samples between these domains. Um, and the high-level idea of how this works is by enforcing this uh, property they call cycle consistency, um, in addition to all the normal GAN objectives, so it's still a GAN. Um, so you start with an image X in domain Z, domain A, say it's an image of zebras, and then you translate to domain B, say it's an image of horses, and then you translate back to domain A, so translate back to zebras, and the uh, zebra image that you get after that process should look pretty much exactly like the image the zebra image that you started with. Um, so that uh, gives you an idea of how the method works. And as a result, um, you can basically translate between any two domains that have sort of reasonably similar information content, um, such as going from summer scenes to winter scenes, uh, horse scenes to zebra scenes, photographs to different artists. Um, so this is a, a really cool approach. It's almost um, you know a little bit magical that it works, and it produces some really cool, compelling results. Um, now I'm, I'm going to touch on a little bit of work using GANs for audio synthesis. Um, so WaveGAN on the left here was one of the first attempts to produce raw audio waveforms using GANs. And they showed that, um, for example, you can train unconditional GANs to produce reasonable um, one second clips of piano music or human speech. Um, MelGAN was work on text to speech that takes as input um, Mel spectrograms and produces raw speech audio as output. Um, and then there was this other text-to-speech uh, work from our team at DeepMind called GAN TTS, where we take the linguistic features aligned in time as input and produce also produce raw speech audio as output. And um, both of these text-to-speech methods um, work reasonably well for speech synthesis, which is uh, pretty exciting because they're also quite efficient relative to many of ex existing state-of-the-art approaches to text-to-speech. So in addition to images, people have also used GANs to generate videos and predict future frames of videos. So you can apply a lot of the same tools in the toolbox that we've used for images to videos as well, of course, since you, know, uh, since you have within a frame the same two-dimensional structure that we have for images. A frame is an image. Um, but you also have a third dimension time. And that turns out to make this problem a bit different and arguably quite a bit harder than it is for images. Um, partially just because of the computational resources it takes to store and generate videos versus still images, uh, but also because humans are quite sensitive to unrealistic motion. So it's important to get that right in order to have reasonably convincing results. Um, so in all three of these methods on the slide, um, a, lot of, a lot of work has gone into making that uh, computationally feasible. So one thing that we did in DVD GAN, for example, in the middle here, and it was further developed in TriVD GAN, um, was to decompose uh, the discriminator into two separate discriminators, neither of which um, are seeing all of the pixels in the video. So it ends up being computationally feasible that way. So there's one discriminator that we call the spatial discriminator. It operates only on a few individual full resolution frames, but it only sees a few of the frames, a subset of them. So that um, but that discriminator basically ensures that each frame looks coherent um, independently. And then there's another discriminator, the temporal discriminator, that sees multiple frames, but they're spatially downsampled. Um, so that also doesn't see all the pixels, because it sees downsampled um, versions of the images. But that one is going to ensure fluidity over time. Um, so together, that uh, makes the problem from um, comp almost computationally infeasible to being fairly feasible. And finally, just to give you a final taste of the many domains in which people are applying GANs, um, there's uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so this is work on using GANs for imitation learning called Generative Adversarial Imitation Learning, or GALE. And essentially, it uses a GAN-like method to learn a generator, which in this case ends up being a policy, which learns to imitate expert demonstrations by fooling a discriminator whose inputs are state action pairs. 
and it addresses uh, many of the typical problems that people see with standard um, behavioral cloning methods um, in reinforcement learning. Um, there's work on using GANs for image editing so that um, amateur artists, for example, could specify just the course layout of a scene without having to actually paint every single detail. And then the GAN um, can go in and fill in the low level details with some pretty nice looking results. And they have a pretty fun demo that you can try out online if you're, if you're interested. Um, there's work on using GANs for program synthesis. There's this work from DeepMind called Spiral, where you have a generator that instead of specifying each pixel value has to specify individual actions like the brush strokes in a painting program. So it has to produce these discrete instructions and you can't directly backprop through this generation process like you can in sort of standard image generation GANs. So you end up having to use a reinforcement learning approach to do this and you can imagine that you could apply this um, to all sorts of different types of programs, not just um, drawing ones. Um, there was a really cool piece of work recently called um, Everybody Dance Now, which was used for motion transfer. Um, so you could take photos of somebody um, in different positions who's not a very good dancer and map the movements of a professional dancer onto their body. Um, so it looks like they have you know, professional level dance skills. And um, if you haven't seen the video demo of this already, you really have to go look it up and watch it because it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing and super entertaining. Um, GANs have also been applied to domain adaptation. So domain adaptation, if you don't know, is this problem where, say, um, um, you might have a bunch of labeled images of things happening during the day with, in the daylight, and you want to train a classifier on that data and then apply it to images of things happening at night. And by default, this won't work very well as there's going to be a domain shift between day scenes and night scenes. And uh, there's different methods um, of alleviating that problem. Some of them are using GANs, like this one here. Um, and finally, there's a number of artists using GANs for different kinds of um, human-machine collaborative artwork, kind of. Um, and they produce some really compelling art this way. Um, this is just one example of that called Learning to See from an artist, Memo Octon. His work you should definitely check out if you're interested in. Cool. Um, so thank you. I hope this uh, lecture has given you a good idea of the broad array of things that people are doing with GANs. And I hope this might even inspire you to look further into some of these applications or try some new applications of your own. Thanks.